Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to Data-Driven DEI, How to Foster Lasting Change in Systems and People. I'm Kian Lee, Vice President of Consulting at Community Science, and we are also a BCT Partners company. And it's my privilege today to welcome Randall Pinkert, CEO and Managing Partner of BCT. Say hi, Randall. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. I'm very excited for today's conversation. And thank you, Kian, for your leadership and pulling this together. Thank you. Um, before we start, I just want a quick refresher that we started this series back in December 2022 with this webinar with Elvis Fraser and Randall as well about are you missing the E in DEI? We had a great conversation about this and how do you make sure that you're focusing on the E because this acronym DEI is often used together and often the DEI uh, three letters are used interchangeably. So we had a pretty good discussion about that, wouldn't you say, Randall? Oh, it was very insightful. Uh, I very much appreciated the insights that you and uh, Elvis shared and the dialogue that we engaged in. It's a, it's a timely conversation. As we discussed, the E has gained its prom in prominence since 2020, and we're all still netting out what it what it means to the work. The second webinar following that was how do we build on what's working and keep moving in the right direction because we know that we can't stop even if things don't always go the way we want it to go. And then this webinar, which was earlier in 2023, um, we had Nellis, Emily, and Jasmine join us providing three different perspectives about what it means to do this work in different types of organization. Um, from a profit profit organization, corporation to a nonprofit organization. And this was hosted by my colleague Amber Trout. So again, we heard a little bit about what they felt were the things to do and not to do when you're trying to move a DEI strategy forward and landed in the same place that we landed in the first webinar, which was that again, the three letters are often used interchangeably and in that process we can lose sight of the E. So today, um, joined again by Randall, we want to talk a little about data-driven DEI and how we can use data to help drive a DEI strategy that would be more effective. And I think Randall's going to talk a little bit about the importance of data, both for personal and organizational growth. Um, we're going to discuss some of the ingredients that we think we've been missing for years in trying to do this work in a better way and then setting the groundwork for a successful DEI journey, what that means. So hopefully you will enjoy the discussion today that we're gonna have with Randall. Um, before I move on, just wanna say, introduce you to Community Science. This is who all our wonderful, talented people are. And um, we are also part of BCT Partners Company. Data-driven DEI. Um, I think when Randall, when we spoke back in December, this book had not yet been published. Um, it was coming out and congratulations, it's been out since. Um, and uh, if you haven't seen it, everybody, please, I encourage you to go purchase it. What does the data-driven DEI mean? And I think, uh, you know, it provides some hindsight about helping you understand where you've been and where you are and where you need to go. Um, and that's the foresight part, the insight about what's the most efficient, effective, and optimal strategies for your DEI journey, oversight, providing some metrics and KPIs to be able to monitor the performance of your DEI um, journey, and lastly, some highlights, which allows you to gauge progress, evaluate results, and demonstrate impact along your journey. Um, so I think this is what the data-driven DEI is about in today's conversation. Um, Randall, I really want to start by asking you, what data do you think is necessary to inform DEI strategies, both, I guess, personally and organizationally? So I think about it as a cycle, Kian, and data can inform every step of the cycle. And, and where that cycle begins is DEI incentives, and I'll key off the letter I for each of these. So the first letter I is incentives. Uh, what's the motivation behind pursuing a DEI journey, either personally or organizationally? Now, some might term 
the latter, the business case for DEI. And there's been lots of research, lots of data uh, to make the business case. There's also been a lot of work which doesn't get as much attention on the personal case for DEI. Data that suggests the benefits that are derived to you when you have more diverse relationships, more inclusive behaviors and more equitable practices. So first is data can inform the incentive. Second, we'll call the DEI inventory, which is data can help you to know where you are, establish a baseline, call that a DEI assessment. That might be a good way to just encapsulate it. Third, DEI initiatives. What do you wanna do? What are your objectives? And how can you assign a measurable goal to know you've accomplished the objective? Data allows you to do that. Third, DEI insights. How can you benchmark what's working for others? What does research, proven practices, promising practices, dare I say best practices, suggest work for somebody else or some other organization that you might employ for your journey? Next, DEI initiatives. What strategies would you pursue and how can data tell you the progress you're making against those strategies? Last and final step is where most people naturally go when we talk about data and DI. DI impact. How do I measure my results? How do I evaluate what worked and what didn't work? Dashboard, scorecards, take your pick. But again, if you notice that cycle, data has a different dimension at every step in terms of how it can inform to your question, DEI strategies. That's helpful to hear you say that um, because I can look at the cycle, but the way you just explained it, and we've had lots of these conversations before, I think I had kind of two aha moments. One was when you talked about the business case, for me, it's framing as what's in it for my organization, what's in it for my business to want to focus on DEI. Second is what's in it for me, right? And I think we're going to talk about this in a few slides later, sort of the interplay between me and my organization. Mm -hmm. Um, But I hear that it's like, yeah, what's in it for me, which is, I think, part of what the challenge has been in trying to make that business case, because everyone looks at it as a moral incentive. Mm -hmm. And we're never really quite able to articulate clearly beyond moral incentive what's in it. So if somebody doesn't believe that there's a moral incentive, how do you convince them that both it is a moral incentive, but also a business incentive? Mm -hmm. So that's what I heard you say that I I think I heard a little differently this time after several conversations with you. And the second part is what I love what you said is that depending on where you are in the in the cycle that the data actually has a almost like a different role it's providing a different type of data to inform mm-hmm. that stage and I would love to dig into that a little bit more mm-hmm. having said all that in all the different stages and i'm assuming that either you personally or as an organization you've kind of gone through the stages whether successful or not you've kind of gone through it what do you think still are the like the piece of the data that you think like if you didn't have that data, you can't really move to that next stage? Great, great question. For, for me, it's it's a combination of, of of two things. One is to your points a moment ago. Have we clearly captured, defined, and articulated? what we believe is the value to us personally or to our organization. You know, because again, I started there not by accident because that is the foundational step. It's, I call it step zero. Because if you can't articulate that, forget about DEI, that's the case for anything that you might do. Hmm. What's the value, you know, the most popular radio station on the planet is WIFM. What's in it for me? And we can say that explicitly or we can say it implicitly, but we're asking that question because there are always competing demands Mm -hmm. on people and on organizations. So it begs the question, what should be our priority? What should be our focus? And data can help to illuminate why the almighty question, why Should we be doing it? Why should we invest resources? Why should we care? Why should you care? Why should I care more than I did yesterday Mm -hmm. into today? So that's first. And then second is, and we've had this discussion, Kian, uh, it still baffles me that 
DEI is not treated by leaders with the same rigor and regard as other functions. We put a goal on manufacturing. We put a goal on our philanthropic investments. We put a goal on hiring and recruiting. We put a goal on operations. We put a goal on our finances. We put a goal on everything. Then we get the DI. Oh, that's a quota. <laughs> oh, no. It's, lo- it's soft. Oh, it's loosey-goosey. We can't put a number on it. What do you mean you can't put a number on it? Of course you could put a number or a qualitative measure on it. Like you do everything else. You do it in marketing, which marketing unto itself, advertising is all quantitative and qualitative. So that to say, Ken, it is articulating the case for why it matters personally, organizationally, and then quantifying and qualifying what's the objective and the goal. That's what's missing. Okay, great. And I think we're going to come back to it later about like, why is it that we've tried so hard and it still feels like we're not getting there? So I want to come back to that question at the end of this. Mm-hmm. I, I would like to ask you this next question, which I think we're seeing right now in our country. It's the backlash we're experiencing with the idea of DEI and wokeness, right? And, and that the word wokeness right now is, and in fact, in some circles, DEI and wokeness are bad words. Um, what do we do about this? Because we know that we still, we, we have to do it and it's important and it's more than wokeness. I mean, wokeness alone doesn't get us where we want to go. Um, but what do we do about this first step, which is, you know, if you don't, if people aren't buying into it and don't like those words, the conversation's already shut down. You can't even go anywhere from there. Yeah, no, it's it's a, it's a troubling a trend. And I, I heard it described under a word that I've now begun to incorporate into my vernacular. I heard it called reversity. <laughs> right. Reversity. Yeah, reversity. <laughs> that that kind of captures it. Uh, we're moving in the wrong direction. Uh, backlash is another good uh, word there to, the, to your question. I, I think first we have to understand what underlies the backlash and the, and the anti-wokeness uh, and resistance movement. I think some of it is fear. Uh, people are afraid that their power, their standing, their way of life, their very existence is threatened by DEI. Some of it is ignorance. I think people are blindly perceiving DEI as indoctrinating people, rewriting history, establishing quotas, lowering standards, dividing people, when in fact, mm-hmm. DEI is liberating people, balancing history. Uh, maintaining high standards and bringing people together. And I think last is misunderstanding. When people hear the words, and you and you keyed off this, Ken, equity, diversity, and inclusion, I don't think that they're equating it with fairness, dignity, and justice, right? I mean, and there it is on your slide. Like that's the root, but I don't think people are hearing that. And it's been co-opted for all the reasons I decided a moment ago. So what do we do? I think uh, we have to meet people where they are. We can't vilify or dismiss the fear or the ignorance or misunderstanding because it's real. Like if we talk about lived experience, whether I agree with it or not, it is someone's lived experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we also have to create safe psychological space for differing perspectives to be heard, which means we have to create space where people who are very unlikely to be dialoguing to have dialogue. And I know that's something that you are always a champion of, Kian. And I think uh, last, we have to connect the head to the heart. Uh, it's, it, and I, I think we have far more in common than we give ourselves credit. And the other word you had there was humanity. Mm-hmm. So I think when we talk about messaging um, to the naysayer, to the detractor, to the resistance, I think I do think storytelling and uh, how we uplift stories, uh, both from marginalized communities, but also from, quite frankly, those in the majority who have had their own experience and their own journey with wrestling with DEI and saying, hey, like I've come to embrace this. How did you come to get there? I want to hear that story, too. I think we have to lift them up as much as we lift up marginalized voices in the context of the resistance. Have you had an experience where you've had to approach like you're walking in 
and you know the issue is about equity and the lack of equity, the lack of diversity, the lack of inclusion. And if you use those words, they're not going to hear you. Have you been in those situations and how have you how have you moved the conversation forward? So I, I throw them a curveball, Kian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, people expect when I walk in the room or any of my colleagues for that matter, and, and you, uh, we all have done this work. They expect that when you enter into discussion around DI, you're going to enter the door through the, the portal of race or gender or sexual orientation, et cetera, um, age, disability status. I mean, those are usual suspects for discussion around DI. Uh, so I, I've come at some audiences on cognitive diversity, thinking preferences, and they almost look stunned. <laughs> huh. uh, they're like, oh, oh he's, he's talking about how we all think differently. Like, yeah, yeah, that's what, that's what we're talking about. Um, because it it's less, people are less defensive. Hmm. Um, and in fact, they're actually more embracing, like, yeah, I do think differently than my colleagues. And like, I'm more analytical and they're more creative and so-and-so is more logical and the other is more experimental. And we have this whole wonderful potpourri of, dialogue around our thinking preferences and then to their chagrin to, to their surprise i'm like guess what we're talking about diversity equity and inclusion right now how can i make sure that your diverse thinking and my diverse thinking can create better teams better innovation and etc and now we can begin to have a conversation also about race or gender or other marginalized identities after we've taken people off of their defensive position mm. by coming in through a different door that's interesting. So this actually is connected to a question that um, is in the chat right now, which is what you're talking about is kind of moving a dialogue forward, right? And that you don't shut down the conversation right away. So moving a dialogue forward is difficult and can take a long time as this question is saying. Are there any insights you have or any tools that you have to fuel that effort I, it, it's shifting the way we work, but the incentives for that change are not in place yet in many places, as this person has said. Um, so uh, do you have any thoughts or anything, that, anything you've used that's worked to move the dialogue forward quicker than what it would normally take? Or is this dialogue going to have to go at the pace of the people's readiness? Yeah, no, it's a great, great question. And th thank you, Diana, for, for asking that. Uh, there's a method that I've, I, I've incorporated into my, my repertoire um, called the, the LARA method, L-A-R-A. -A. It stands for listen, affirm, respond, and ask. And I got to be careful because my, my sister-in-law is Laura, but it's, this is Lara. <laughs> and, and you uh, have to try this Lara on your sister-in-law, that. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Uh, and there's a toolkit out of Stanford University called the Are You Ready to Talk Toolkit. The Are You Ready to Talk Toolkit. And Lara is one of six parts of the toolkit. And I'll just say this to answer the question, um, to this idea of difficult dialogue. What we know among many things about difficult dialogue is it's much easier to enter into a courageous conversation, uh, hot button sensitive issue topic, when the person with whom you're dialoguing feels like you see their perspective, like you honor how they see things. And a dialogue is about understanding. A debate is about winning. A discussion is about deciding. A dialogue is about understanding. And three of the four steps of Lara are not about you. It's about them. Listen to what they're saying, the L affirm what they said. And that's the hardest one. Because right now, what you want to do is you want to respond and you want to, uh, you want to make your point. No, you have to affirm what they said, whether you agree or not. The third step is about you. Respond with an I statement, an own statement that owns how you see things. And then the fourth step is again about them. Ask them a question. Be inquisitive to get into their world and get into their skin to see the world the way that they see it. And that is not a silver bullet, but it absolutely helps to smooth the the gears of having a difficult conversation that is really really hard like you said 
your instinct is to disagree, especially if somebody is saying something that pushes your button or makes you feel like they're insulting and offending you. Mm -hmm. How do you develop that skill? Any tips there? So, so I love that you said that, Ken, because one of the tools in the Are You Ready to Talk toolkit is it helps you to identify your hot buttons. <laughs> mm. They have like a hot button questionnaire or something along those lines <laughs> in the toolkit so that you can go into these dialogues knowing up front what might be your triggers, what might take you off center. Because when you're in a difficult conversation, you want to wear two hats. You want to be in the dialogue, owning your lived experience, but you also want to be a facilitator of the dialogue. And that's where we can often get derailed because if it's a hot button issue, the last thing you're thinking about is how am I going to facilitate this discussion? Because I don't like what you just said. Right. <laughs> I got an issue with your perspective. So right. knowing your hot button triggers sensitive topics, better prepares you to stay in both modes, participant and facilitator. That's great. I'm going to a very difficult conversation on Saturday, and I'm going to keep this in mind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that very much. Um, my next question then gets a little bit of what you said early on, right? What What's that interplay between personal and organizational strategies? Because, you know, it, it's not always about personal. It's also what we have to do to move policies and laws and stuff and actions. And I think so much of what we end up doing today is we default to the personal and we default to the self-reflection, which feels a little bit easier than trying to think about all the systemic barriers yeah. that are in play and how do you even change a whole system, right? So we start there, but we know we, we got to figure out how to also change systems. So where do you think is that interplay? Yeah, another, another great question. Um, so you've heard me me relay this, and, and I'm not saying anything that many don't know, uh, and, uh, is that there are four types of barriers that we can be talking about. Two that are personal, two that are organizational. The personal forms of barriers are personal and interpersonal. Personal is people's beliefs. What I believe can be a barrier to you. If I don't believe that women should be leaders, I can be a barrier to you, Kian. But I believe women should be leaders and you're a wonderful leader. <laughs> uh, interpersonal barriers are our behaviors. How I behave can be a barrier to you. If I display discriminatory behaviors or microaggressions, that can be a barrier to your experience, to your advancement, et cetera. And, those are, and, the, and that, to your point, Ken, is what most people often focus on when we have these conversations. Personal, I want to change people's beliefs, or interpersonal, I want to change people's behaviors. But they obscure the other two barriers. Third is institutional, organizational culture, climate, norms, policy, practice. Like, and that arguably is really what the, what the action is. It is easier to remove bias in a process than in a person. I'm going to say it again. It's easier to remove bias from a process than from a person. And if I remove the bias from the process, it doesn't matter what biases those people bring to the table. When the big five orchestras couldn't get women to get hired and they modified the process by putting up a barrier, mm -hmm. so the evaluators of talent couldn't see the performers of the music, women's participation in the orchestra went up 500%. Now, if you asked the evaluators of the orchestra, are you biased against women? Their answer would have been, no, I'm not biased. But guess what? You actually didn't know it, but you are. Because they were 5% women before they made that change. And then 25% women after they made the change. And the only thing they changed was they couldn't see who was performing. That's in the book uh, Blink mm -hmm. by Michael Gladwell. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the fourth barrier is systemic, which is those institutional barriers that replicate themselves across multiple institutions. Think about redlining in financial services. It wasn't just one bank that did it. It was multiple banks. So all that to say, Ken, uh, to your question, we really need to focus more of our efforts on the institutional 
because that's where we can make and wield the biggest changes. And we can, in some ways, nullify behaviors and beliefs because they have to follow the process. There's a, there's a question in the chat. How long must we play it safely when the risks and ills of not addressing or centering equity and DEI in its fullness outweighs the rewards of continuing to meet people where they are and have conversations that have been repeated for decades? That's a, that's a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to put you on the spot. Sorry. No, that's the, you know, and let me say why it's tough. Um, uh, not necessarily tough to find an answer, but tough, I think, to accept what I would offer as my own answer, uh, which is I have an overriding fundamental premise of meeting people where they are. You know, I, I and I, I am yet to be shaken off of that centering. So if the question is implying that, you know, there's this risk versus reward, there is meeting people where they are versus feeling like we're repeating ourselves for decades. I don't know any other way to facilitate change with someone who is grown and, and, and is no longer being parented and can make their own decisions and, and choose their own path than to meet them where they are. Now, granted, there is this idea in the workplace that you cannot tell people what to believe, but you can tell them how to behave in the workplace. You cannot tell them what to believe, but you can tell them how to behave. So there are levers that we have to say to people, I don't really care what you believe. Here are behaviors that you have to adhere to. Now, that, now that's not necessarily meeting people where they are. That is in some ways telling people where I need you, want you to be, or you don't have to be here anymore. And that's just enlightened leadership that's willing to stand firm to say, if you don't meet these expectations, then you got to go. So I balance it out. Okay. Principle number one, meet people where they are. Principle number two, enforce the principles and standards that are at my disposal that might change their beliefs, but most certainly will change their behaviors. I'm going to try and reflect this because there's a question in here. I want to challenge us all to, to, to jump into. When you say that, then the assumption that the person who has the power to enforce the beliefs is, the, is, is enforcing the, the, the right beliefs, the beliefs that people are valued for whomever they are. And that person has the power to do that. And we can get to a better place, a better organization that way. How do you approach? And I know that given all your organizational experience, this is not new. Here's a situation I've seen over and over again. Um, an African-American person in an organization, not in a high position of power and is implicitly, never explicitly, suggested that you can't wear your hair natural mm -hmm. and like yeah you want to assimilate into a different kind of look how do you handle that because that person is in no place to be able to change the practice the policy that the organization is implying in a very implicit way you know, great question kian and 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 perhaps clarification perhaps not uh, the ability to enforce the principles that I've espoused. I'm speaking specifically to the organizational's articulated values. So if we value as an organization fairness, if we value teamwork, and that's articulated, it was in your interview, it's on our website, it's been socialized, that we can now nowhere on the website does it say, or in a mission, vision, or value statement, you got to wear your hair a certain way. Those are implicit norms, but that is the spirit of your question. So I don't want to ignore that. Um, my advice to that African American employee is you got to triangulate between three things identity, intentionality, and reality. Identity says you define yourself on your own terms. And if how you define yourself is wearing your hair a certain way, so be it. But second is, is I'm going to go to reality. The reality is that might have implications for where you work. And you can make the choice to change. You can make the choice not to change. But know 
Some of it is out of your control. Do you fight? Do you forego? Or do you take flight? Those are your options. But then the third is, and this is the, 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 the key, intentionality. What do you want to accomplish here? Do you want to be the CEO? Like, is that your intentionality? Because if you want to be the CEO, you're probably going to have to make some accommodations. What you can't do is say, I'm going to do what I want to do the way I want to do it any way, anytime I want to, and expect that that's going to get you to the C-suite. So when you triangulate between identity, hmm. reality, and intentionality, then you make the judgment call of where you stand in between those three lines. Okay. Got to process that one. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. I can also see the other side, which is why should anybody have to make a choice about how they wear their hair in today's world? Like, yeah. <laughs> and I want to be clear, Kian, I agree with you on that point. Like, I don't like that they have to triangulate across all three. I would rather they only have to decide that based on reality, uh, uh, identity. Identity, yeah. Identity. But the, but, the, but the fact is, in the real world, reality and intentionality are factors you have to consider, you know? That's my take. Okay. Thank you for that. I know I kind of threw you that one. We're going into the set of slides. I know that's part of, that's extracted from your book, Randall. So I, I, maybe you can talk a little bit about this, um, kind of that whole personal organizational and I can change the slides for you as you move along. Sure. Uh, I, I, you know, one, of the, one of my favorite excerpts from the book is, uh, organizations don't change, people change. And we've had this conversation as well. Uh, people are the essential building blocks of organizations and society. And so it begins with how we think, how we process information and the stimuli, the experiences, the exposure, the lived experiences that we have. You can go to the next slide. Uh, from there, we look at the interplay between personal dimensions of DEI and the organizational dimensions of DEI. Um, on one hand, the, the personal dimensions or the personal benefits, I might dare say, you know, the opportunity for growth, diversity of thought, innovation, learning, enhanced performance, better health and wellness is what the research tells us, are the personal benefits of DEI. And then the organizational benefits are myriad. Uh, out recruit, out retain the competition, um, foster environments of trust and belonging and engagement, uh, enhance decision making, innovation, financial returns, the list goes on. And then in the middle of all of that is how data can inform data driven decision making. And hopefully, if we use the right approach, the right techniques, the right way of processing and analyzing data because data itself has its own biases, we know this, we can arrive at some measure of unbiased perspectives or at least mitigate bias in the perspectives we arrive at. You know, quantitative combined with qualitative, making sure we have representation in focus groups and interviews, making sure we have, you know, representative samples when we conduct surveys, like to make sure we, uh, and being intentional and diligent about the voices that we make certain are a part of how we collect data to glean insights. And now to our earlier conversation, it lands us at the four Ps that are our key considerations. How do we transform people, transform practice, transform policy, and enhance performance? Those are the four Ps. Thank you. I think when we were talking before and you know, I asked you about the book and what were the hardest parts, like which parts of the book did you struggle writing and which parts of the book just came easily? I think you said something about that most of the personal journey and thinking about that, the, if I recall correctly. So this next slide talks a little bit about, um, you know, Randall's journey. And I just wanted to couch that in the conversation we've had before about that interplay between personal organizational and where as you wrote the book, you, you had to work through some of that. So you want to say a little bit more? Absolutely. Um... Without question, <laughs> the hardest part of writing the book was speaking to the personal journey. There's been so much research, so much work around D 
DEI for organizations. I mean, you can go to almost any organization's website post 2020 and you can find a statement, a commitment, uh, an artifact of their DEI journey. And there's been lots of research around the, the organizational case. I asked a D, I asked an audience of DEI professionals just two weeks ago, what's in it for you for DEI? And the first response I got from a room full of DEI professionals was, it'll help our organization. <laughs> and I'm like, I didn't ask that question. I said, what's in it for you? And I said, I need you to be selfish. What's in there for you? And uh, one of the books that transformed my personal life was The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Mm -hmm. And Covey advises you to write a personal mission and vision. I have a personal mission and vision. In my book, I advise people to also write a personal DEI mission and a personal DEI vision as the beginning of your personal journey. And so what people have hopefully been reading on the slide while I'm talking, which took me a while to craft and include in the book is the self-reflection and introspection of why this matters to me. Forget about what my organization tells me. Forget about whether they're on board or not. Why does it matter to me? And that's what I captured here in my personal DI mission and my personal DI vision. Let me get a little personal if it's okay. Why Please. was it so hot? Why did it take you so long to craft this? Well, it, it, it begs some deeper probing questions about deeper probing concepts. You know, mission is purpose. It's why you're in the world, hopefully to make it a better world. You're calling. Uh, so I had to spend some time with that. Like, what do I think I'm called to do? in a DEI context. And then vision, if, if, uh, if mission is the why, vision is the what. What difference do I hope to see in the world because of my presence in the world? And, and my initial answer was, I, I don't know. <laughs> Let me spend some time and think about that. Mm -hmm. um, what are the issues I think are, that I'm a witness to as you know, uh, as a part of my generation? What are the talents and the gifts that I bring that could make a difference? So it's, it's some really deep questions that I had to wrestle with uh, to arrive at something I felt was authentic and was personal and that I could look at and read and say, yeah, that, that that's it. Hmm. It's interesting because as I'm reading it too, what I see come off the page that you talked about is how are you going to go about your work, your business, and being in this world in a way that ensures that you're being fair and that you're facilitating fairness, that you're making sure that you're respecting others, and that you're, you know, you're 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 going about things in dignity and giving other people the dignity they need and the humanity of all. Like it's what you said before. If I just took the word DEI out and I took some away this words, I can see it being very easily replaced by those four words, mm, mm. which is the underlying reason for why we want to do DEI because we want a fair world. We want we want to be respected if we're not being respected. We want to make sure that we're allowed the dignity that everybody else is allowed. And we want to make sure we're all, you know, proceeding in this world with humanity. No, no. And on that point, I'm just noticing that the words diversity, equity, and inclusion are nowhere to be found in my mission. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. And then I think that's good. That's good. One of the one of the exercises that we do now with some of our partners is to say to them, you know, when you're creating a theory of change or a logic model and you have that box all the way to the right and says impact, we have equity. And I challenge uh, the people we work with, they said, you're not allowed to use the word equity in anywhere in this thing. <laughs> now what are you going to say how are you going to break down what equity yeah. means in that context that you're working in on the issue you're working in mm. and you're just not allowed to use the word equity inclusion, that. diversity and that's that's kind of made people pause a little bit mm. Mm. i can see that i can see that it, it forces you to probe deeper
mm-hmm. get under the hood. What do we, what do, what, is, what, what do we really mean? And what does it really mean to us? Yeah. Right, right. So you're going to make each one of us, all your vice presidents do this now? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I do think it's a good idea. Um, this is about Johnson & Johnson's mission and vision. You want to say a few words about it? Yeah, yeah. The book has a laundry list of examples on all the topics we've discussed. And, and, and lest I forget, for those that are on the webinar, go to datadrivendei.com. Uh, there you will find free uh, templates, tools, resources, case studies that can scaffold you on your personal and organizational journey. Uh, so I, I looked for an example of an organization that I thought had a, a, a well-articulated DEI mission and vision, and I, and I landed on uh, J and J. Now, granted, they're also one of our one of our clients, so I may have been biased, but I thought they did a wonderful job. I mean, if you know J and J as I do, J and J has what they call the credo. The credo is 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 kind of their their uh, their statement of purpose and intentionality. It's more than a mission and a vision for the organization, although they have that too. But the credo is like this eclectic mix of guiding principles and philosophy and uh, and history and how the organization sees its place for its employees and in society. And I, and I think it's no accident that an organization with that credo uh, ended up being an organization that I cited because to have the mission and vision and to have the DEI mission and vision, I thought it was just very well stated in terms of uh, you know, advancing their culture, uh, unleashing the potential of their brilliant mix of people in every corner, and a vision to use every person and their unique experiences and backgrounds to spark a better, healthier world. Like, it's inspiring to read what they had captured there. They, I don't know who facilitated that, but uh, kudos to them. <laughs> I know you don't have to talk about Johnson and Johnson, but here's a question. Let's say you replace this with any organization that has a great credo, has a great mission and vision about DEI. Um, do you think that they're able to actually implement it? And what would facilitate, I guess this is my question, what would facilitate really effective implementation of the vision and mission and what could really challenge it? Mm-hmm. Well, what can help facilitate it is uh, uh, executives who walk the walk and talk the talk. It, it's not performative. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are on their own journey. Again, mm-hmm. organizations don't change; people change. Uh, they have clearly articulated goals to which they're being held accountable. Mm-hmm. And in an ideal world, it's also tied to their compensation, and that that trickles down to middle management because middle management is where DEI goes to live or goes to die. Mm. Uh, some call it the frozen middle. It, it, has, it has its own term, how DEI efforts get stalled, if not stymied uh, in the middle manager ranks. And so we need a competency model that both defines and equips them with the skills for them to lead on these matters. Uh, call it inclusive leadership, call it managing diversity, call it what you want to call it, servant leadership for that matter. Um, But having that competency model addresses what we discussed earlier, which is what, or what can be their fear. You know, I'm from the old school. We don't talk about this stuff at work. What do you mean? You're not supposed to be talking about courageous conversations. It addresses the skill gap. Most managers or many managers, I should say, are not trained in in how to be inclusive leaders, how to create psychological safety, how to create environments of trust and belonging. Um, And if it is a competency model that HR is is supporting, then hopefully it's also in their performance evaluation, which gets back to, I can't tell you what to believe, but I can tell you how to behave. So the competency model I'm evaluating you against says, I need you to make certain that all voices are being heard. And if you can't demonstrate that behavior, you will not get a good performance evaluation and you will not get your bonus. Mm -hmm. So all the things I said, just turn them on their head. That's where it can get stalled, uh, Ken. Remove uh, executive commitment, remove accountability, remove managers with the skills, remove managers that are 
being equipped and it all falls apart. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. I hear you. I hear you. Um, I had another question for you, but I think we've kind of said that. Um, do you think that self-reflection and introspection are sufficient to get us to a more just and equitable society? I think there are probably different versions of these questions um, floating around. And I heard you earlier say that, you know, that's four parts of it the, on the personal side. I, I think there's that on the individual side, that's the personal change, the personal beliefs and change and the behavioral change, right? And on the other side is the institutional and the systemic work. So you, you got to have an you got to have both ends is what I heard you say. That's exactly right. Yes. Do you want to add anything more in response to this question? No, no. Just that self-reflection and introspection are necessary, but not sufficient. Um, we got to, we got to hit all cylinders, personal, interpersonal, institutional, and systemic. Um, the next set of slides talk about that five-step cycle. So if you want to just give our audience a little high level of what this five-step cycle is, that'd be great. Absolutely. Uh, so, First step, as we mentioned, DEI incentives. You and or your organization self-reflect, introspect. What is your motivation for pursuing a DEI journey? And much like you don't change your mission and vision very frequently, that's the reason why it's step zero. You don't, I don't, I'm not going to change my DEI mission and vision tomorrow. It will last me for the foreseeable future. I might revisit it, but it's step zero because it's, it's, it's definitional. Next step, DEI inventory, perform an assessment. You can do that personally of your preferences and your competences, or you can do it organizationally of your people, practices, policies, and benchmark performance. Next step. Next step is DI imperatives. What do you want to do? What are your objectives? That's a qualitative statement. And what are your goals? That's a quanti quantitative or qualitative way of knowing you've accomplished the objective. Next step is my favorite, DEI insights. Before you decide what you're going to do, pause for the cause and ask the question, what has worked for somebody else or for some other organization? I'm not saying it defines what you do, but it should inform what you do. Don't reinvent the wheel. I'll say it that more simply. Next step. DI initiatives. Now, believe it or not, step four, what are you going to do? What action will you take? What strategies will you pursue? Are you going to establish employee resource groups for your organization? Are you going to read a book for you personally? Are you going to travel someplace that will expose you to different cultures? Are you going to create a DI council? I mean, these are all personal and organizational initiatives you can undertake, but make sure you have a measure to know that you've made progress. Last step, DEI impact. Look at your outcomes and your outputs. Your outcomes are the things you ultimately want to accomplish. You want to Strengthen an inclusive culture. I want to behave in ways that are allow me to navigate and bridge differences. Those are ultimate results, but the outputs are the intermediary steps. I read a book, I watched a video, I traveled to a country. Those are outputs that can get me ultimately to the outcomes. And the cycle continues. It's never ending, just like it is on your screen, folks. Right. You keep going and going because DEI is a journey, not a destination. That's right. I'm actually curious. I'm going to throw this question out there since we have a little bit of time. Where have you seen this cycle just completely break down mm -hmm. and you can't continue this cycle? Oh, that's, that's, that's easy, Ken. I, I regularly have clients come to us and say, we want to go right to step four. <laughs> like, we don't want to do an assessment. We know what our problems are. <laughs> we don't need to benchmark what worked for somebody else. We got an idea. We just need to pull together an action plan so we can get to the work. Mm. Well, if you follow this methodology and you go right to step four, and you can see how that could be a problem. Um, and I know that people complain about survey fatigue and or we've been assessed over and over again. Well, I got news for you. If you don't know where you are, you cannot know where you're going. You have to establish the deeper, penetrating, foundational stance on why this matters. You got to do an assessment to know where you are. 
And then we got to be clear about where we're trying to get to based on the assessment, because your DEI strategy is only as good as your assessment. End right. of sentence. Yeah. End of sentence. And, and, I, and it behooves you to not reinvent the wheel. So if you don't go through step zero, one, two, and three, and you jump to four, and then we tell you we're not taking on the project, and then you call us a year later and say, oh, you know, oh, it didn't work. <laughs> right. We've all been there. That's right. That's right. We have had that experience and we do the same thing. We, we start with saying to them, like, why are you doing this? Which is what you're saying, right? That, that step zero, the mission division. And once you figure out the why, and that's where people get stuck, like you said. I mean, it's sort of like, well, this is the right thing to do. We should be doing this. And like, but why is this the right thing to do? And you spend a lot of time there before you go into the action steps. I totally agree with you. We've seen that too. Um, I want to just make sure and encouraging our audience also that you can enter questions in the Q&A tab. And so we have about eight minutes. So if you have any questions you're dying to ask, please feel free to put it in there. Um, here's one. Okay. The argument that information can be unbiased depends on the definition of bias. Certainly those who argue from their perception of truth or based on a particular philosophy or system of belief will be unaffected by contrary information since they're not interested in growth or development, but in maintaining what is right in their mind. If it's right, how can it be unfair? That's true. How can you collect, analyze, organize, frame, present information such that it has any potential to make a difference? It's a great question. So I don't know if you've had any experience there, um, Randall. I think you talked a little bit about it. One is just framing it as, you know, what's fair, what's with human dignity, um, with respect. I think those are all ways of framing it. Are there any other ways that you've successfully framed or organized information so that it can be heard and it can be make a difference? Yeah, I want to. Um, I want to honor the question by reflecting back what I take from it in my own words, Art, which is we live in an era of, what do we call it? Alternate facts. <laughs> yes. Uh, and the implications of the broken contract that people are entitled to their own opinions, but they're not entitled to their own facts. And people now feeling entitled to their own facts creates a more than difficult, if not disquieting reality of what we even mean by the truth. And you put it in quotes in your question, the truth, what is, what is the truth? Do I, am I entitled to my own truth? <laughs> and, that, and how do I, how do I engage in a dialogue with somebody who believes that they're entitled to their own facts, their own science? Uh, extraordinarily difficult. And that's underlying your question. Those are my words, not yours, Art. Um, but I do think there are ways that are not unassailable, but can certainly maximize the likelihood that we do arrive at some semblance of agreement that there's truth within the data. And it gets back to what I mentioned earlier. We have to be vigilant at making sure that the data itself is representative of all voices. And that's not just marginalized voices, also majority voices. Meaning if we can say we have, we've talked to these groups, we've talked to these constituencies, we've talked to these identities, We've cast a wide net. We've been very intentional. We've had a focus group with this group and with that group. We elicited perspectives from that group and the other group. Is that a silver bullet? No. But if people can see a reflection of themselves in the data and the intentionality and hopefully a third neutral party so that they don't think that the source of the data itself is biased, I think it at least gives us a fighting chance that we can all say, this is representative and therefore there is some truth into what we've been able to find. Thank you. You, you made me, you're making me think about how in research and evaluation as we collect data and there is so much emphasis on making sure that we collect data from voices who are typically not heard and or dismissed 
which I think is very important, um, it, it kind of gives me pause to like, how do we make sure that we're looking at a different set of perspective or are we listening to the same voices only over and over again? And, and, and I'm not sure if it's, we should ever, we should never obviously dismiss or not listen to those voices that are often not heard. But what does it mean to also think about the voices of the majority or kind of the other side, the other end of the spectrum in mm -hmm. our research and in our evaluations? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've shared with you, as I've shared with others, you know, my, my, my personal journey, uh, I used to watch only one cable news channel. And I had to challenge myself, well, how do I know that I'm looking at this issue from all the angles if I'm only getting my news from one source? So after the 2020, uh, no, 2016 election, uh, I decided to diversify my news sources and to include sources with whom I completely disagree. <laughs> like, I just don't see it the way they do. But I, I felt obligated because what is the truth you know i have to be an i got to be a, a responsible uh uh kind of uh, uh i have to have responsible media literacy which means i can't just look at it from one angle i gotta expose myself to different angles if it doesn't if, even if just to reinforce my own perspective but at least to know i've taken all things into consideration yeah that's tough. That's like training ground for what you said before, which is the whole Lara <laughs> concept. <laughs> How do I not stand in front of the TV and yell at it half the time, right? So, um, my real, last yeah, question to you, we have a few minutes, like any, like one piece of advice do you have for our audience who want to move, you know, DEI forward? I, I will, I'll, I'll say this, Ken, and it ties into something you asked earlier. The, the hardest part of the book was speaking to the personal journey. But the most profound and inspiring and insightful part of writing the book was gleaning insight to people's personal journeys. I have uh, two case studies on the data-driven DEI website of people. People who were willing to share with me their stories of how they've used data to drive their personal improvements in diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm talking about folks who carry around behavioral frameworks in their wallet. <laughs> People who regularly take self-assessments to see if they've moved the needle on their behaviors. People who challenge themselves in their family discussions and in their travels to go and discuss things that they normally wouldn't do. I was blown away. I'm, and I'm a, I've been in this DI space for decades. I'm like, my goodness, I need to step up my game. <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, these stories were 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 inspiring. So if you haven't gone to read those case studies of uh, uh, Andre and Juliet, Andre, Andre and Juliet, apologies, Andre and Juliet, you got to read their stories. I mean, the stuff that these folks are doing. And I had a hard time finding people who use data in their personal journey. You can imagine why. So these two have been gems among other people I talked to who didn't make it onto the website that were just enormously inspiring. Great. Well, I know time is up. This, this means, Randall, that you need to take a little bit more time off and start traveling more too. <laughs> <laughs> My wife would agree with you. <laughs> I, I want to say thank you so much for your time today. It's it's always fun talking to you and learning more. And every time I talk to you, I get another piece of aha. So, and especially on this topic. So thank you for taking the time and thank you to our audience for listening and being with us today. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate you. And I appreciate right. the audience. Thank you all for coming out. Have That's a wonderful it. day, everybody. <laughs>